thank you again. Such exciting promises that you've given to us. Thank you that we can dig in your word. Uh, just be wowed by what you are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, again, this is uh, part two of the Millennium Chronicles. This is the Millennium Heaven and Earth. There's a question mark there. Uh, I'm going to stretch your brains again. Uh, mine has already been stretched, so I'm going to make you suffer too. Uh, but I think you're going to discover that when you, when you see these pieces in a different way, it's going to connect a lot of dots that were very scattered before. Things that just didn't make sense. Now, we were told in Daniel 7.18 that, in the, that God is going to create a kingdom that will last forever and ever. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. We're told in Daniel 2.44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. But the problem that we have is that our traditional timing says that you'll have the thousand years, the final God of Satan, and then God blows up the planet and he creates a new heaven and a new earth. So how can he possibly give this kingdom to the saints of the Most High forever and ever if he's going to blow it up after the thousand years? Well, the answer is that he's not going to blow up the planet after the thousand years. He recreates the planet at the beginning of the millennium because what happened at the second coming? He just destroyed it. It, it was down for the count, and so he had to give us a new heavens and earth. And we see in Revelation 21.1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. Compare that now with Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. For the child shall die 100 years old, and the sinner being 100 years old shall be at first. When I began to look at these, I said, wait a second. If Revelation 21, 1 is coming after the thousand years, which is a traditional, uh, traditional chronology, I said, how can it fit with with Isaiah 65, 17. And I began to realize that the traditional chronology does not fit at all. Uh, we've already seen what happens there in the second coming. I won't go over that. We just looked at it a second ago. God creates new heavens and earth at the beginning of the millennium. Again, the traditional chronology is the sheep and the goat's judgment right after the second coming. The millennial new heavens and earth, that's what people say. Then Satan's final rebellion after the thousand years. Then the great white throne. And then the new heavens and earth. That's the traditional chronology. And they say that there's two sets. Uh, a, millennial, new he a millennial heavens and earth. And then the eternal heavens and earth. But if we go back and look at these things together. Considering all the verses that talk about this. We have to come up with a different chronology. And that's the sheep and the goat judgments. And then right after that. We have the new heavens and earth. The new Jerusalem descends at this point. Satan's final rebellion. And then we have the great, great throne. And then life goes on forever and ever and ever in a great way. So there will still be a thousand year period. I still advocate that. I'm just saying that when do the new heavens and earth come about? At the beginning of the millennium and not after. That's, that's the big paradigm shift. But I, I think you will see that it makes a big difference as to how pieces fit together. Well, are we talking about a different earth? Or are we talking about the current earth that's going to be healed? John says, I saw new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no more sea. Again, Isaiah 65, I create new heavens and a new earth. These have to be one and the same earth. Notice that the first heaven and the first earth passed away. That means that what John is seeing is only the second set of heavens and earth. And so therefore, when God himself in Isaiah 65, 17 says, I create new heavens and a new earth, it's the same exact heavens and earth that John is referring to in Revelation 21. However, uh, commentators, because they have been confused about the timing, uh, they suggest that Isaiah was confused. And I think that's... Uh, <laughs> That is uh, hubris, I would argue. Uh, uh, the Pope of Commentary says, best, perhaps the best explanation of that is, is that of Dalich, that there are to be altogether three worlds or three ages. And Dalich says the current age, the millennial age for select people, and then the heaven or eternity. He says Isaiah and the other Old Testament prophets 
have an indistinct view in which the second age and the third age are confused together. <laughs> really? Okay. All right. You would know that because... How would you know that? I mean, how do these guys come up with this stuff? As you see, it's because they have the tradition, and the tradition is immovable. So therefore, the Bible has to move. That's the problem. You say, well, we know that the new heaven will come back for the thousand years. So therefore, what Isaiah is saying, well, he must have been confused. Well, let's think about that for a second. Who's speaking in Isaiah 65? Was it Isaiah? Or was it God himself? It was God himself. Isaiah was just taking notes. And the other prophets were just taking notes. They weren't the ones speaking, and they weren't confused. God was not confused. I think it's the commentators who are confused, right? And I was confused, too. But I had to overcome this kind of stuff, and it wasn't easy. So if you're confused a little bit, it's okay. Uh, but, again, once we can see where to put this, it makes things a lot easier. But here's what Barnes says. The passage before us, speaking of I-65, is highly poetical, and we are not required to understand it literally. There is, so far as the language is concerned, no more reason for understanding this literally than there is for so understanding the numerous declarations which affirm that the group creation will undergo a change in their nature of the introduction of the gospel as it was. Not sure what he's talking about there. But uh, the traditional timing is that you have the great white throne judgment that I saw, a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven led away, and there was no one's place found for them. And then, just after that, you've got the new heavens and you've got the new earth. And they say, well, 21 comes after 20. So this makes sense. But as we've already discovered, the book of Revelation is written thematically and not chronologically. So Revelation 20 gives us the big bird's eye picture of the thousand years. And really it's all about Satan during that, those thousand years. Right? An angel comes down, has a big chain, takes Satan, throws him into the pit. And then the people, and we hear a little bit of what's going to happen, a little bit of judging going on, and then Satan is in the pit for a thousand years, and after the thousand years are over, he gets out, he goes to the of nations, they come against the beloved city, they surround it, and fire comes down, and destroys them. It's all about what happens to Satan during that time. And then Revelation 21 and 22 are about the new Jerusalem. It's not about heaven, all right? So your, your concept of heaven my concept of heaven is flawed because we are thinking of this sort of never, never land somewhere out there. But we're talking about, when you read Revelation 21 and 22, you're reading about the new Jerusalem. And that is a city. That city is going to come down on the planet Earth. That's where that city is going to be. We see that very clearly in Revelation 21. So only if you have a new body can you go into that city. If you are a mortal, so that's not going to be us, because we will be there as immortal. We'll have our new celestial body, thank the Lord. So don't worry. You're not going to sin with any age to come. You're, you're good to go. But there will be people who will be the children of the, of the survivors of the, of the tribulation. They will be mortals, and they'll have kids, etc. They're like to be somewhat similar to ours today. But of course, the devil won't be there. So, the... The, the, the current, uh, the, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, those are going to remain forever. Unfortunately, people have gotten this idea that, well, in heaven, in, in eternity, you won't have the sun, the moon, and the stars. Well, it talks about in Revelation 21, it says that the city had no need of the sun, for the Lord himself, God himself, is the, is the light. So the city doesn't have any need for the sun, the moon, and stars. But they will remain, but their light will not do anything for those living in the city. Imagine if you went outside right now and you took out a flashlight. Do you think it would make any difference? No, because the sun is much brighter than your little flashlight. Your little flashlight doesn't add anything to the light of the sun. Even though it's on, it's shining, but it makes no difference because the sun is much brighter. So first of all, Notice here in Isaiah 4, uh, Psalm, Psalm 148, praise him all his angels, all his host, sun, and moon. Praise him all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, for he commanded they were created. They also established him forever and ever. 
he made a decree which shall not pass away. These ordinances, the sun and the stars, will never pass away. They're here forever. And again, this has been glossed over by most commentators. Israel's existence is tied to the existence of the heavens and earth. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So Israel's continued existence is predicated on the continual existence of the sun and the moon and the stars. The earth is established forever, and he built a sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has established forever. You laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. One generation passes away, another generation comes, but the earth abides forever, we see. So Jesus said to them, Surely I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you have followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This regeneration is the Greek word palingenesia. It's the, 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 the rebirth, literally, is what that means there. And we find that same word used in Titus 3.5 talking about you and I. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, through the washing of palingenesia, of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So just as you and I are going to be a new creation, the old has passed away, but all things have become new. We're a new creation, but it's still you. It's still me. That's a good thing, isn't it? If it were a different you, and it were a different me, then what's the point of all this? You know, just let's go out and party, because if there is no life, if there isn't another me, if there isn't me, if it's not me, or you, if it's some other you, then it's not even worth you, is it? <laughs> It gets complicated, doesn't it? So it has to be you. It has to be me. But it's going to be a new me, and it's going to be a new you. So there's some part of you that's still there, but it's like a new, a new shell, a new piece of hardware, if you will. And the same thing is true of the earth. It's going to be the same earth, but it's the earth renewed. Notice in Romans chapter 8, it talks about the earth liberated, not the earth destroyed. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. A guy named Dr. Robert Gentry discovered from his study of, of granite looking at uh, polonium that... Uh, that it lost a, a alpha particle very early in creation. I believe that that alpha particle escaped at the, the, the fall of the earth itself, when uh, degeneration actually entered into the rocks, into the trees, into the grass. So when we talk about the earth being, being uh, in a state of corruption, bondage of corruption, it's because the very earth, the rocks, the trees, are, are wearing down, they're, they're falling apart. When God created them, they were not like that. That alpha particle, or whatever it was, had not escaped. There was no, there was no decay occurring. You know, it's interesting, if you have granite countertops in your house, uh, you can take a Geiger counter, and you can discover a very, very low uh, amount of radiation. That's because those granite countertops are in a very slow state of decay. They're, they have a little bit of degeneration radioactivity because they're falling apart. Now, it may take uh, millions or billions of years for them to fall apart completely, uh, but they are falling apart. And that's because the very earth itself is in a state of degeneration. The earth is groaning, wanting to be liberated from that bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So when the children of God are revealed with the Lord Jesus, then the earth is going to be restored as well. And what's so amazing about this is that when Adam fell, the entire earth fell, and the animals fell as well. You see, Adam is the spoke, or he's the hub that all the spokes go to. Adam was taken out of the Adama, Adam from the Adama. Adama is the earth or the soil or the dirt. And he, God took the Adama, he formed him, breathed into him, 
then whatever happened to Adam would then happen to the earth. Adam was earth man, dirt man. I think you used to call it at one point dirt bag. But I think that's what Adam was. <laughs> so whatever happens to him happens to the entire planet. When he's living and vivacious, so is the planet. When he's corrupted and full of death, it spreads to the entire planet. So when he, when he died, the entire earth died. Eve began to die as well because she was taken out of Adam. The animals began to die because God said, let the, living, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And it was so. So everything is connected to Adam. So now when the second Adam brings life, then the earth can be restored. And that will happen at the beginning of the millennium, not after the thousand years as it's commonly taught. The new heavens and earth uh, created at the beginning of the millennium. Again, we see that there's a potential of death at the beginning of the millennium. God says, I create new heavens and a new earth. And then he says, for one who dies at 100 years old, we thought of your youth. So we still have the potential of death at the beginning of the millennium. And it was this verse that I kept struggling with, I was wrestling with this. How do I make sense of this in relation to Revelation 21.1? We saw what, what Dalich says and what the pulpit commentary says and what uh, Barnes says. They basically gloss over. Well, Isaiah is confused. I mean, that's not a very good answer. So we have to take it literally. We have to reconcile these. And in order to do that, we have to sacrifice that sacred cow of the new heavens and earth coming after the heavens. They actually come at the beginning, and that uh, makes things everything fit in place. Even in Isaiah 66, 22, can somebody turn that off? It's kind of yeah. uh, For as the new heavens and earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no more place for them. Now, this is where uh, a, a critic might say, now wait a second, we got this verse right here, it clearly says that this is when the new heavens, or this is when the old heavens and earth uh, pass away, right? It's, it's after the great white throne, right? So Jesus was on this great white throne, um, or, you know, God, as they would say. But I want you to understand, who is on this great white throne? Who did God say he would give all judgment and authority to? Jesus. So Jesus is the one on this great white throne. In fact, we saw in Revelation 20, verse 4, it says, Thrones were put in place, and to them was committed judgment. And then in Revelation 20, 11, John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And I argue that this is an adjectival parenthetical statement. Uh, it's it's, it's what, like what we, we might do. Imagine if you, you went to the mall and there you saw an astronaut. And you come and tell me and say, hey, Doug, I, I saw the astronaut. I saw an astronaut. Oh, which one? You, you know, the one, the, the one that walked on the moon. Oh, uh, Neil Armstrong? Yeah, that's, that's the one, right? So you're using a description of what he did to tell me who he is. And John is doing the same thing here. He's not telling us, he's not saying that he sees this one on, on the throne and then the, the heavens and the earth pass away. No, he's saying, this guy on the throne, you know what's special about him? This is the one from whose face heaven and earth had fled away. So he's telling us something that already took place. It took place at the second coming. That's when the heavens and the earth fled away is at the second coming. And now that same person is sitting on this throne and is about to judge uh, everybody who has not yet been judged. So we also discover that the, the use of the aorist tense in Greek, uh, aorist is just the past tense uh, without uh, any aspect, okay? And I don't wanna bore you with grammar. But uh, it may help you to understand. It can basically be translated as a pluperfect. All right, uh, Eris just means that it happened. But it can it can frequently be used as a pluperfect of the past of the past. Uh, is what the pluperfect means. It's like saying uh, Johnny had had eaten three cheeseburgers when his father went and bought a chocolate shake. All right, so he would already finished this when he started to do this. All right, both happening in the past, but one was finished before the other. And that's essentially what we have. That the heavens and earth had fled away. 
from his face. Uh, well, what about the sea? Uh, what about this whole thing of the sea? And in, in the millennium, we know that there's going to be water. But in uh, Revelation 21.1, it says that there's no more sea. Well, this really bothered me because I, th I thought, boy, I'm putting all these pieces together, but this one seems to really be a, a wrench in my machine. Uh, how does this work? Well, what I discovered is that it says that there was no more sea. The word there is singular. Okay, details matter when it comes to scripture. Because uh, we see that the sea is going to be turned to blood. So we certainly want to get rid of that uh, in the new heavens and earth. So that's a good thing, that, that the sea is going to be destroyed. But what did God do in the beginning? In the beginning, God created the seas, plural. Okay, And if you go back, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Walt Brown uh, has, has modeled what he believes the earth may have looked like before the flood. And there was much more land available than there was water. So you could think of it basically as a series of great lakes that were on the planet, uh, freshwater, of course. Uh, so there's a lot more land mass than there was seas. And those seas were plural because they were not connected. If you go and look at a map today or, or a globe, we say, well, here's the Pacific, here's the Atlantic, here's the Indian. But really, it's one big sea, isn't it? Because you can circumnavigate the globe. The John proved that for us. So it's one big, big, big body of water that we just call by different names, but it's one big sea. And so when it says there was no more sea, singular, that's because that big body of water that turned to blood is God. Thank God for that. We don't want to see that anyway. Uh, so then God is going to make all things new. So after the Lord Jesus comes back, it says the mountains melt like wax. All the greenery has been turned to nothing. Uh, fire is, is coming down on planet Earth. Uh, a question people ask me is how, how can anybody survive? I mean, who is still alive at this point? Well, not many people, I'll tell you that. It says that men have become more rare than the gold of Ophir. I'm dying to know how much gold there is in Ophir. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it's apparently not very much, okay? So there won't be that many people on planet Earth. Those that do survive, uh, we do have a few clues. It says it may be that, uh, you know, uh, trust in the Lord, for it may be that in the day of wrath, he will hide you in Zephaniah. It says that in Zephaniah chapter 2. So my thinking is maybe when the angels go out to gather his wheat into his barn, that they just kind of hug everybody and uh, protect them from God's fire. That would be my uh, solution. Uh, but I don't know. That, that's just a guess. But anyway, what's happening to the planet is it's now a barren wasteland. But it's a barren wasteland, but it's actually not barren anymore. It doesn't have anything growing on it yet because it's been destroyed. But now it's ready. Now it's full of life. That degenerative principle, that property of decay, has been removed, reversed. And now it's ready. It's just ready, full of life, ready to go. And just like on day three of creation, that God created the earth, and then he said, let the earth bring forth uh, all the, 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 the grass and the shrubs and all these things. Then it just came up. And I imagine that it, it happened very, very quickly. So that you go from this desert wasteland to now this beautiful place. He says in Isaiah 41, I will open rivers and desolate places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know the Holy One of Israel has created it. So it's then transformed into this beautiful place probably in, in a moment that God says, okay, now I create all things new. Both thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you curses the ground in Genesis chapter 3, and then it's removed. Instead of the thorns shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. There will be on every high mountain, on every high hill, rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. You see, this is when the Lord is going to restore planet Earth in the day that the towers fall. That's called the day of the Lord. 
Yet hear, Israel, who I have chosen, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth in the singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. Break forth in the joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. They shall see the glory of the Lord. I will do a new thing, and it shall spring forth. And I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the land. So everywhere that this river goes, it's going to touch the land, and it's going to make it just come up. So probably as this thing happens, the city has come down to planet Earth. The, rim, the river of living water starts to flow down. And the moment that it touches the Earth, the Earth just sucks it in and receives new life. And it's at that point that the earth is restored. The grass starts to grow. The trees start to spring up. Maybe it's, maybe it's a process as the river goes out, things start to, to come up. We don't know exactly. But uh, it would be something very beautiful. Uh, the animals restored. Again, when Adam is restored, and then the sons of Adam are restored, so too will the earth be restored and the animals as well. Remember, the animals uh, fell into corruption because the earth fell into corruption. And they became hungry, etc. They started to kill one another. In the age to come, in the millennium, it's not going to be like that. In that day, I'll make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter to the earth, from the earth, to make them lie down in safety. Safety, he says in Hosea 2.18. The wolf also shall grow up the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young child will flat fatten together, and a little child shall feed them, shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den, they shall not hurt nor destroy all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy at all by holy mountain, says the Lord. So everything is put back the way it ought to be. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people that I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. Now, when it speaks of God's people, when it speaks of his elect, it's speaking about the Jews. Again, we as Gentiles are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. You can check that out in Ephesians 2, 12, if you don't believe it. Uh, then he will give the rain for your seed with which you will sow the ground and bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful, and in that day your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been filled with the shovel and fan. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land, and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. So our conclusion here is that the new heavens and earth come at the beginning of the millennium and not after, as is commonly supposed. Now, it's at this point, and we, we've described this, but in our timeline, the new city is coming down, and then some of these things will begin to happen. But it's hard to explain all that in one, in one breath. So now we'll look at the new Jerusalem. The beloved city is on the earth during the millennium. So when it says that they will go out and, and surround the beloved city in Revelation 20, it's talking about the new Jerusalem. Now the millennial Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem are one and the same city. Dispensationals have traditionally broken those up and said they're two different things, but I'd say no, they're actually one. And I'll prove that to you. Great is the Lord in the city of our God and in his holy mountain, beautiful elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. 
the city of the great king, Psalm 48, 1 and 2. Compare that with Hebrews 12, 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So you see that in Hebrews, it's clearly talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. You can't deny that. There's lots of angels there, in fact. It's called Mount Zion. It's called the city of the living God. Psalm 48 is called the city of God. It's called the, his holy mountain, called Mount Zion. So these are both the same place that we're looking at here. And we see that Mount Zion is the new Jerusalem. This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. That must be the new Jerusalem if God's going to be there forever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever here. I will dwell for I desire it. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. We see in Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away in the spirit uh, over, above, or on a great and high mountain and showed me the great <coughs> city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now I put in the, the Greek word there, epi, because... In most of the translations, in fact, almost all of them, it says he carried me away to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city. But the, the Greek word here, epi, is over, above, or on. He carried me <coughs> over a great and high mountain. So the picture is, the angel comes, he says, hey, John, you want to go see the city, the lamb's wife? Yeah, I love to. So he picks them up, they go fly, they fly over, and they're looking down at this great mountain, that great mountain, is none other than the new Jerusalem. And in Ezekiel 40, Ezekiel has a very similar experience, but again, the translators have done something funny with the preposition. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me uh, toward, is what the, the Hebrew actually says, uh, though in most, uh, in most translations it says he set me on a very high mountain, on it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. I, I'm really quite frankly dumbfounded uh, why they would choose to put the word that he sent me on a very high mountain. I have substituted the word on for the word toward, so you can check that out again if you're uh, wondering. But Ezekiel 40 verse 2, it should not be on, but it should be toward. What's the big deal about that? Well, first of all, this is the Hebrew word el. El is just a very simple preposition. It means toward. You would never think in English that toward could suddenly be something toward on. You say, what are you talking about? Toward means toward, like to, you know? It doesn't mean on. And the same thing is true in Hebrew. It's to be set toward. So John, or excuse me, Ezekiel, uh, he gets a vision. He's taken to, to Israel. The angel sets him down, and he's now looking toward a great and high mountain. And there's something about it that has a, like a city structure on this mountain. Whereas John gets a flyover this great high mountain, which is the New Jerusalem. So Ezekiel gets to see it from a distance. He sees a big mountain, and he sees the city-like structures on it. He's built it. John gets to fly over it, and he sees right now into it. So both of them, though, are describing the New Jerusalem as a mountain. And I'm going to challenge you again, because is the city a mountain? Or is it a cube? Is it a pyramid or is it a cube? Think about that. We'll talk about that in just a second. He says to Satan, you were in Eden, the garden of God. You were the anointed chair of the covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth from the fifth fiery stones. I, uh, Satan says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. When we compare that with Psalm 48, we, it, again, we see the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful elevation of the earth, Mount Zion, on the sides of the north. These are both one and the same place. Satan was in the holy city of Jerusalem. He was on the, the heavenly Jerusalem, at this beautiful sides of the north. That phrase is used only twice in scripture. And Satan wanted to go up into the city of God, onto the mountain of God, and he wanted to declare himself to be uh, something he wasn't right then and there. Uh, God, Zion is God's mountain. 
I will return to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem should be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, etc. So many scriptures attest to this, this fact. The mountain of the house of the Lord. This is uh, Har Beit Adonai. There we have in Micah 4. Many people should come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This is Isaiah chapter 2. It's the same as Micah 4. 1. God's throne is on the earth during the millennium at this time. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. And then in Revelation chapter 4, I mean, I was in the spirit, and I told that a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Look, wherever God's throne is, that's where he is, right? So if God's throne is in Jerusalem, if it's, if it's in the millennial Jerusalem, then that must be the heavenly Jerusalem. Talking about the throne of God. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And then their mouth is found on the seat, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So God is clearly on the throne. But notice also, Jeremiah 3.17, speaking about the millennial time, says at that time Jerusalem should be called the throne of the Lord. Well, I guess that's where God's throne is. It must be where it is. Uh, Ezekiel 43.7, and he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. I guess forever is like a really long word, I think. Uh, so he's going to put his throne there. He's going to dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. This happens in the context of the millennium, not a thousand years later. I hope you see how just putting the, the, the new heavens and earth at the beginning, it resolves all of these Bible difficulties that we have. We're like, well, what does that exactly mean? Putting that in the right time frame, the right chronological sequence, now all these other verses find their proper place. It puts Israel in a very exalted place. That bothers some people. But hey, who are we to complain against what the, the potter wants to do if he wants to exalt the Jews? Let him exalt the Jews. Don't worry. You'll still get free food when you get there and get great time. Uh, again, Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on a throne. This is uh, in the, the New Jerusalem. Isaiah got to see a vision of this. He didn't actually go there personally. But he got to see it pretty good. Uh, the, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Your throne of God is forever and ever. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the ancient days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Again, God's throne. This is where God is. If God's throne is in uh, on the earth, then, then God must be there. Proceeding from the throne of God and of the land, there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the land shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Etc. So God dwells forever on Mount Zion. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Fire shall devour before him. He's going to be here. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. Etc. Many people should come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord of hosts. God loves the gates of Zion, etc. Some of these verses we've seen already. I bring them out again just to show you that these verses are talking about. Zion, the city of God. God will dwell gloriously in Zion before his elders. Isaiah 24, 23. For the Lord of hosts will reign over Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Where else do we see that? Well, of course, in Revelation 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders. So you have both places talking about these elders. Right? So Isaiah 24 is where God is going to be on the earth. So, so therefore, the city must be on the earth at the commencement of the millennium. And again, we see these 24 elders. God himself will be in the city. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It's feminine singular. The you is feminine singular. It's referring to Jerusalem. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and dark, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be seen upon you. The you there is Jerusalem. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Well, of course, we see this same imagery in Revelation 21. But Isaiah goes on. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Therefore, your gates shall be opened continually. They shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in procession. 
They shall be call you the city of the Lord, of Zion, of the Holy One of Israel. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness your the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light. And your God, your glory, your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Compare that with Revelation 21, 23. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. So again, it's not that the new heavens and earth don't have the sun, moon, and stars. Those are eternal. But the city had no need of the sun, moon, and stars. Right? Uh, it's just like, you know, again, when the sun is shining, you don't need the street lights to be on. That's the basic idea. You take your flashlight outside on a bright day, so what? It does nothing for you. And that's the same thing here. The city has no need of the light of the sun, though the sun will still be there. The light of the sun will be seven times brighter than it is today, but it won't make any difference. And Jerusalem will dwell safely, and this is the name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness. That's the name of Jerusalem in that day, because God is there. He says in Ezekiel 37, I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also shall know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem should be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. This is the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet. I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and I will dwell in the midst of their midst forever. And the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there, Adonai Shalom. That's the name of the city, Adonai Shalom. I have, to, I have to conclude, I think God is there. I think that's what he's trying to tell us. And yet we keep saying, no, 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 that can't be. It's impossible. Yes, it is possible. It's very possible. Sing and rejoice, O God of Zion, for behold, I have come that I will dwell in your midst. Again, again and again and again in these passages, they, they line up with what we see in Revelation, because Revelation is a thematic book, it's not a chronological book. Revelation 21 and 22 are events describing the city, and that city is going to come down in the millennium. He's going to uh, be with them, be in their sanctuary, in their, in their midst forevermore. Uh, now, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, this brings us up to some interesting things here. Uh, we have the Jerusalem above and the Jerusalem below. For this corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So Paul is talking about the, the Jerusalem, which now is, is in bondage with her children. The Jerusalem that now is, is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So when that veil passes away, then the two domains become one. And the Jews have long understood that there's a Jerusalem above and there's a Jerusalem below. There's Yerushalayim Lebaha, Le Leba, and there's a Jerusalem. And when that veil goes away, then these two become one. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. For he, Abraham, waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their people, for he has prepared a city for them. So Abraham somehow knew that that God was going to prepare a city. That's, of course, what Jesus says. I go to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back for you. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, 14.2. Again, uh, Psalm 48, the city of our God, holy mountains, the city of the great king. These are really one and the same place. Compare them with Hebrews 12, 22. Notice here in, in, in Hosea 2, talks about Jerusalem. It says, bring charges against your mother, Jerusalem. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight. So God was married to Jerusalem, a.k.a. the Jews, and says, I'm divorcing you. It's over. Sorry, baby. I'll see you later. <laughs> but then he says, and I says, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees. I, I bring that out so you see that it's not simply the people. It's actually the place as well. It's both. A city is made up of really three parts. It's made up of a, a place. Okay? I, I, I flew into Austin. Okay? I, I didn't come here. But Austin also has a bunch of buildings. There's a downtown. I can go and see the sites. But there's also you. You are Austin. 
right? So that's what makes a city, three principal parts. You can't have one without the other. But then he says that he was gonna re he's going to bring back the captives of his people. And he says, I will betroth you to me forever. I guess I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and love and kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And you shall know the Lord. It shall come past on that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heaven and the nation shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. They shall answer Jezreel, that I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who has not obtained mercy. So he says, I'm divorcing Jerusalem, and he says, I'm going to betroth you to me again forever. Well, what do you call a woman who is betrothed to a man? He's called a bride, isn't she? He's called a bride. And just so that uh, a resource you may want to check out is why God did not know it's Calvinist. And I talk about how God chose the Jewish people, again, not for salvation. The biblical concept of election never means predestined to salvation. And it's commonly a reference to Israel. So that'll help you to sort of get your mind around these things that I'm talking about here. But the heavenly Jerusalem descends, or here comes the bride. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is a hard one to grasp because we keep calling ourselves the bride. Oh, we're the bride. The church is the bride. Uh, and Israel is the wife of Jehovah. Uh, I'm not sure who started that one. I think it was another DTS kind of guy. But uh, not that I don't like Dallas Theological Seminary, but for what it's worth. Uh, but notice here in Isaiah 62, you, Jerusalem, again, the you is feminine singular, shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land anymore be termed desolate. You shall be called Hepzibah, the land of Beorah. Hepzibah is my... His delight is in her, or my delight is in her, and Baalah is married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Again, the feminine singular referring to Jerusalem. This is the same imagery that we have uh, speaking of Jerusalem coming down. Revelation 21 2, that I jot and saw the new. So the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the angel says, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit over upon uh, a pea there, a great high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So the bride is the lamb's wife, the the, the city is the bride, which is the lamb's wife. But again, a city has three parts. It's got a place. It has infrastructure. It's got buildings and streets and bridges and all that stuff. And it has people. It has people. So all that I'm arguing against is this idea that the church is exclusively the bride. Though we become part of the bride, we still get to enjoy all that bride stuff. But the city is specifically called the bride. And then we, it says in Isaiah 62, are going to marry the city. And it says God's going to marry the city. So we become, therefore, uh, uh, God's wife by virtue of that. Now, I posed a question before. The new Jerusalem, is it a cube or could it be a pyramid? Uh, let's think about it. Is the city a cube? Uh, this is how some people would imagine a big block on planet Earth. It's, uh, rather unsightly. It's completely artificial. It's uh, not in, in sync with this nice round planet. Uh, it's kind of a, a weird size and shape. Uh, again, you know, some people think it's just going to, that the city's going to be up there hovering above, uh, above the Earth, sort of like the board in Star Trek. You know, it's be something like that. Uh, a pretty weird looking city, in my opinion. But from all that we've seen in Scripture, where it talks about the holy mountain. Well, here's what mountains look like. They look more like pyramids. Or should we say pyramids look more like mountains? Maybe that's the way to look at it. That pyramids really are a resemblance of mountains. Uh, Thomas Constable, he says, well, it could be either way. We don't really know. So at least somebody is willing to admit that it could be either way. I would go a step beyond and say, no, it's actually going to be a pyramid. It's definitely a pyramid. And God is enthroned on top of that. Uh, in the name of the city, my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of, out of heaven from my God. Uh, but you've come to Mount Zion. Notice there again, it's a mountain. 
the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, so we've seen all this. This is the mountain. Again, all these descriptions of this mountain. This mountain, again, just the mountain everywhere that we've already looked at. It's just always described as a mountain. It's never described as a cube. It's never described as a big block. Uh, so that really doesn't have any kind of uh, validity. So thinking of, of, a, of a pyramid, how could it be when, um, well, let's think about this, these, these artificial mountains, or are they counterfeit of the real thing? These pyramids, I argue that they are a counterfeit of the real thing. In uh, a cult practice, they're the same as above, so below. And I think Satan said that because he's been above and he wants to bring it down here below. Even God himself uh, really talks about that because in Hebrews it says that God said to Moses, be sure to, to, uh, to uh, construct or to carefully follow the pattern shown to you because it is a copy of the heavenly. So he was to carefully follow the, the uh, Instructions, the pattern that was given of the tabernacle because it was a copy of the heavenly tabernacle. So, as above, so below. I think that the pyramids, the ziggurats, etc., are a copy of that which is above and attempt to counterfeit that. Because remember, where was Satan? He was on the holy mountain of God. And then he got the boot. And he still kind of soared over that. So, he's trying to get back. So, that's uh, another study for. At a time. Well, the size of the city, its walls, and its gates, we're told, uh, a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand. That's Ezekiel 40. Then we see in Revelation uh, a very similar description. He had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. So he goes to measure the gate of the city, the gates, and its walls. So we're told the measure of the city, we're told the measure of the wall, but we're not told here the measure of the gates. So the city is 12,000 stadia, and uh, the wall is 144 cubits, which is about 200 feet. What about those gates? Where do we see the gates? Well, um, and we'll think about the moment. Uh, Barnes uh, asked, the, you know, he suggests that this could not be similar to literally. Uh, it's absolutely absurd to take this uh, literally. Uh, so does Robertson in his word pictures. It's useless to try to reduce the measurements or put literal interpretations on this highly wrought symbolic language. Uh, surely the meaning is that heaven will be large enough for all. Come on, what a cop up here that it's just big enough for all. If God gives us the measurements, they mean something. No, the question I would ask you, and I don't, I don't do this dogmatically, but it is my hunch that the 12,000 furlongs or 12,000 stadia it says it's the measure of the city. But it's not, it's not every, it's not that each size is 12,000 furlongs, which is 1,378 miles. I don't believe that, it, that each side has to be that long. I would suggest that it's the sum total of all the sides or all the edges. According to Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, they would take that measure and divide it by four, uh, once, uh, you know, basically dividing the four sides. I would take it a step further. So the 1,380, we round it up. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the sum total of all the edges. And because a pyramid has eight edges, that you would divide that by eight. And what's interesting about that is that some of the rabbis argue that the walls of the New Jerusalem of Ezekiel would reach to Damascus. And I went and looked on Google Earth, uh, the distance between Jerusalem and Damascus currently is 132 miles. So that's much more in line with what I'm proposing. It's not an exact figure, but it's certainly uh, much more likely. Another example is that Herodotus, the Greek historian, has given us a picture of Babylon in his day. He says that the city was a great square, 42 miles in circuit. So again, the 42 miles, it's not that it's 42 miles on each side but it's a sum total of 42 miles. So with that understanding, I would argue that the 1,380 miles is a sum total of all the sides. It's not each side that length. Now, again, the pyramid has eight edges, so you divide that by eight, and again, you get a rough measure. I understand that there's you know, the whole hypotenuse and all that kind of stuff, but just for an average, we have 172.5 miles uh, for each edge. And it, 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 it works out actually quite well. 
uh, because he says that the that the uh, the base was equal to the height, and that would still work for a pyramid. You could have the base equal to the height. That would still work. But obviously, the hypotenuse would be longer, but that would still work. So it doesn't have to be a cube by any stretch of the imagination. Nothing in the Bible says that it's a cube. That's simply been an assumption that people have come up with. So it's still massive. I mean, if this thing is what I believe it's going to be, 172 miles high, that means it's still 30 times taller than Mount Everest. That's pretty big. Right? That's still a huge, huge, huge mountain by right? every stretch of the imagination. It's a huge city. So don't worry, there'll still be plenty of room. Uh, no, I suppose I could be wrong on that. So I don't, I don't state that dogmatically, but uh, that's how I would see it. These precious stones on the walls, we see Isaiah 54. O oh, you afflicted one, toss of tempest and not comfort, and behold, I will lay your stones of colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires and make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal and your walls of precious stone. When you compare them with Revelation 21, 1, or 21, 8, 18, 20, you find the same thing. All kinds of precious stones, sapphire, etc. The description is the same. You have 12 gates. The gates of the city shall be named with the 12 tribes of Israel, three of the north, east, south, etc. As this is the Lord is there. And then we see the same description in the book of Revelation. And then the size of the gates. Remember that the angel went out to measure the, the city, the gates, and its walls. We got the measure of the city and its walls, but not the gates. Well, the measure of the gates is given to us in the book of Ezekiel. These are the exits of the city on the north side, measuring 4,500 rods, which is the Hebrew word Mida, and uh, each being a cubit. Now that's according to the, um, uh, let's see, each being a cubit of a handbreadth. So what a rod was, was actually one cubit was 20.63 inches. A rod, or a Mida, equals six cubits. Therefore, a rod equals 10.31 feet. So the total length of each of the gates per side, or the total length of, of all the gates on each side was 46,395 feet. Divide that by three, and that means that each gate is approximately 2.92 miles on each side. And you don't need gates on these things because you're never going to close them. These are just big apertures uh, through which you can pass. The gates are always open. We see this in Isaiah 6:11. Your gates are always open continually. They'll never be shut. See the same thing in Revelation 21, 25. They're never going to be shut. There are no more tears. God's going to wipe away every tear. See the same thing in Revelation 21. God will wipe away every tear. There will be no more weeping in her. And there will be no more sorrow in Jeremiah 31. In Revelation 7, 17, God will wipe away every tear. Uh, the ransom of the earth shall return, return and come to Zion. No more sorrow shall flee away. And no more hunger and thirst. We see that in Isaiah 25, we see it in Revelation 7. So again, the point is that these are descriptions of one and the same place. They're not two distinct places, but they're one and the same. God is going to illuminate it. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. The light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. And that day the Lord buys up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of your womb. So again, the sun and the moon are still there. And now they're actually brighter. But... The moon will be disgraced and the sun of shame for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. So compared to God, their light is disgraced. It's a shame. It's nothing compared to God's light. And uh, his light is there. The city had no need of the sun or the moon because God is its light. But the sun and the moon are still there. And there will be no more night, etc. Uh, so in summary, we see that the veil is gone, all exposed to God's fire and plasma. The earth was destroyed at the second coming. There's no intermediate millennial heavens and earth. There are only two sets. There's the current ones we're in today, and there's the one to come in the millennial slash eternal age. It's going to be recreated at the beginning of the millennium. The mountain of God is the new Jerusalem, and God's throne is in the city. Uh, sin and death are still possible outside the new Jerusalem. Uh, cannot go in the city, and that, that is actually uh, the discussion of my next study. So here's some recommended resources, corrupting the image, the image of God, and the Messianic age, those are the things you may want to take a look at, and of course, the rest of my Bible studies uh, out there at the table. Uh, I'll be at the table if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer those, or of course tonight, uh, we'll also be having the round table. So thank you again. Thank you so much.